Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce Rico Malva, uh, our final keynote speaker for the Microsoft Summit here in Vina del Mar. So Rico um, Malva is a Microsoft Distinguished Engineer, but he is also the Chief Scientist for Microsoft Research. He was born in Brazil and grew up in Brazil, but he tells me that he's also a karaoke, which I think will mean something to many of you. So that is something as well. Before moving to industry in 1994, he was a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Brasilia, where he, and when he joined Microsoft, he started the Signal Processing Group, which developed new technologies such as a new media compression formats, which were used in Windows, in Xbox, and in Office and also microphone array processing technologies which are used in Windows and in the tablet PCs and in the Xbox Connect, as well as machine learning technologies for music identification in Windows Media and, believe it or not, also in junk mail filtering in exchange. So all of these things are due to Rico. He made key contributions to popular vi video formats uh, which are used in YouTube and in Netflix and in Adobe Flash and digital TV. Many other applications are also due to Rico and the groups that he started. Rico received a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which we know as MIT sometimes, in 1986. And he has over 160 publications and 115 patents. If you visit his office, you will find many of the patents in little blocks up there on the wall in, um, in those areas. So because of these achievements, Rico was elected as a fellow of the IEEE, and he received the Technical Achievement Award from the IEEE Signal Processing Society. And a couple of years ago, he has achieved one final award, which was really significant. He was made a member of the US National Academy of Engineering. So with that, I would like to say welcome, Rico, and thank you for coming to address us. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you. Judith, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, es un prazer estar con ustedes nuevamente. Un prazer estar con todos vocês. Uh, pero I have to... Uh, I will uh, now switch to English because my Portuñol is not that good. So, uh, and this is a... I want to talk to you about the Advanced Technology Labs, but I will start a little bit about Microsoft Research in context and then switch a little bit to why we have those advanced technology labs. And because I'm a techie, as, as you saw from Judith's introdu introduction, I can't help but showing you some tidbits of technology which I particularly find interesting and things that were developing in our advanced technology labs. And I hope you will, and I'll try to go fast because, oh, by the way, I don't know if you got the lunch ticket because if you're here, then you can have lunch, so thanks for being here. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to finish faster because I know I'm, I'm between you and lunch. Uh, and of course, I'm not here to, to make advertisements about Microsoft products, but there's this little app from Microsoft Research, which I will be using to control the, my PowerPoint presentation, so you can go to, to the uh, Windows Store. It's called Office Remote, and it has all kinds of nice features. So, if all, assuming all goes well, it depends on Bluetooth, and as you know, Bluetooth is a little iffy, but it seems to be working fine. Okay, let's go. Let me tell you a little, start by telling you a little bit about Microsoft Research, um, because I think that will help the context when I tell you more 
about the advanced technology labs. Uh, Microsoft Research actually started back in 1991 because of a memo which was created, uh, written by Nathan Mervold. At that time, he was our chief technical officer, and he proposed to the company we should have a research lab. At that time, Microsoft was much smaller. The revenues of Microsoft at that time were barely above $1 billion. Well, $1 billion is a good number, but it's much less, almost two orders of magnitude compare, compared to what it is today. And since 1991, the memo is from 1990, uh, Bill Gates really liked the idea, said yes, we started Microsoft Research, and Rick Rashid led the lab for a little over 20 years, and last year, Peter Lee now is our new head of Microsoft Research, and Peter is still driving the boat under the same mission statement. We have the three core sentences that I'm pretty sure many of you have heard before, but maybe not, of you, not all of you. So I will remind you what drives us. Philosophy is very important, and the core philosophy is the MSR is that the first thing we do is we advance the field in the areas we choose to do research. Sounds good? And that basically says push the state of the art. That's what we tell our researchers. Work on the things that you think will drive the state of the art. One very important comment is that the word Microsoft is not in the mission statement. So it's not about driving Microsoft products. We will comp com contrast that to a few slides later where we'll do things a little bit differently. The second mission statement is, of course, well, by the way, we are at Microsoft and we have some commitment to the company. So assuming we invented great things by advancing the state of the art, let's take some of those great things and actually bring to Microsoft products. So it's totally fair that at some point we should be thinking about Microsoft. The third one sounds a little bit pompous, but it's actually true. Ensure the, the future of Microsoft in the computing field. Uh, there are many things that sometimes you don't see, but just to give you an example of something we did along the lines of the third mission. Back about eight years ago, when Bing still was called Live Search, we were having problems scaling up the indices of the web search because, as you know, at that time, if you f go back eight, ten years ago, and you guys, some of you are experts in that area, indexing the whole web was really difficult. So you had to maybe index some part of it and putting the machines together to compute all those indices and the crawling and all of that stuff was very difficult. And more important, <clears throat> the indices were big enough and the content is large enough that any search you do in the web, there is always thousands of results. Now a quick poll among all of you. Who actually goes after page one <laughs> when you search on Bing or any other search engine? Right? So you usually don't go beyond page one. Even there may be 20 pages, but you just click on things on page one, which means relevance is actually super important. We need to find what are the most relevant things. And we used to have a system with sophisticated rules about computing relevance. And then about that time, about eight years ago, thanks to Microsoft Research, we switched to a neural network-based system to compute relevance. So the system just learned. We have some... Uh, uh, ground truth given by people who would click, and we use that to bootstrap the system. So we did a, co a combination, for those of you in machine learning, of supervised and unsupervised learning. And it completely changed the ability of live search and now Bing to provide better results. So the efficiency of a very important property of Microsoft changed significantly thanks to Microsoft Research. And I will, I will mention a little bit more later things like Connect, can you imagine a company other than Microsoft that could have invented a device like that with all the pieces of different pieces of technology that you need to put together to get to a device like that, which opened a new way for you to play games. And now, as many of you know, it's not about games anymore because now all of us are seeing, oh, this whole idea about depth sensing, it has farther implications than just games. So we changed the field, actually. So we do try. <laughs> to hit that bullet so our researchers do have all of those things in mind. And we are distributed around the world. We have all these labs uh, in Asia, India, Cambridge, and a few labs in the United States, some of them with specific names because they are specific groups in some areas. Uh, if I ask you, I'm pretty sure you would know the answer, but why? 
why are we distributed all around the world? If the, the headquarters of the company is in Redmond, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, why do we go to all those places? There's two reasons, right? So I'll jump ahead of you. Uh, one, smart people are everywhere. So here, Latin America, uh, Asia, Europe, so we can find smart people everywhere, and not all these people necessarily want to live in the United States. Second, diversity. People from different societies think differently, they use technology differently, and that has an impact on how technology is developed. So some of the things, for example, that we can develop here in Latin America because of the way I'm from, from Latin America, so I understand the differences. If you travel, many of you have traveled all over the world, you see those differences, you see how people use technology differently. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, if you look at social uh, computing and uh, communication through social networks, all of you are quite familiar with Facebook. And a few years ago, if you go into Brazil, Brazil, everybody was in an, another network called Urkut, which uh, is owned by Google. And everybody thought, oh, wow, they got the, half of the users of Urkut was actually in Brazil. And we don't quite understand why. And then we say, oh, it's going to be difficult for Facebook to to get a market in Brazil. In less than six years, everybody switched <laughs> because people start using, they pull together. Today, Brazil is the second market for Facebook. And it's like, whoa. And it's not that easy to predict that. And to understand that better, you need scientists, researchers, and engineers in the area that can see how people use the technology. That, that's just an example. There's examples all over the place, right? And we also have our advanced technology labs, which I'll talk to you uh, more about, which is the topic of this talk. They actually report through me, which is interesting because my groups, none of them are in the United States, even though I, <laughs> my office is in the United States. So we have a group called ATL Europe, which is in Munich, Germany. We have ATL Israel and ATL Cairo. It's actually fun to get folks from Israel and Cairo to work together. <laughs> and you can imagine what that means, but we take religious barriers and other things away, and the engineers and researchers just work together, which is fun. And as you can see, there's no dot in Latin America, right? So some of you may be thinking, hey, you have something missing. Well, not anymore. We're going to open this year an ATL lab in, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. So uh, if all goes well, we, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the work we'll be doing there. So if we think in terms of return on investment, this is a question I've asked you before in other of these events, and I will ask you again, just to wake you up a little bit. What is the ROI of research? If I ask you the following way, um, look at all the projects at Microsoft Research. What percentage of those projects do you think actually hit the product, let's say, in the short to medium time frame? 90%, 80%, 50%, higher, lower, lower, 20%, lower, 10, yeah, five, no, not one. <laughs> it's actually a, a little bit better than that, but it's not, uh, we actually don't measure. It's not a number that we keep tracking. Uh, I remember when I, I was at some point the, the manager of the Redmond Lab, and it's not a, I would look at a, many, many numbers, and that number I didn't really pay much attention to. But there was the other number, which is, if I flip the question a little bit, this is just an example of many products from Microsoft. What percentage of the Microsoft products do you think have technologies that help that product that came from Microsoft Research? 95. Whoa, you're optimistic. Oh, you're from Microsoft. Okay. <laughs> So, any other guesses? 80, 60? 80, all right. It's actually uh, uh, pretty close to 100. Uh, every product, some of the things you don't see. Uh, for example, I'll, I'll tell you one that you don't see. In Windows, since Windows uh, Vista, we have this thing called Superfetch. You're probably very familiar with caches, right? So if, I, if I'm in an operating system and open an application, the application opens up buffers in memory, files in disk and all of that, and I can cache some of those things. So next time you bring the application, things are cached, it loads faster, you're more productive. With Superfetch, we go a little beyond. 
if every day 9 a.m. you open your uh, Outlook email clients, next day at 8.50 or so, we preload <laughs> Outlook. So when you load for the first time, it already loads faster. So we, we literally prefetched based on the statistics of usage. Sometimes we hit, sometimes we miss. When we miss, it just takes a little longer to load. So there's tons of technologies. If you look at Azure, for example, lots of things. Recently, Microsoft Research made a major contribution where you can have the reliability of duplicating data because you need to duplicate data because hard disks fail, right? You can't store data just in one hard disk. And if you think the naive idea of duplicating by just copying the same data in the same hard disk, in, in a second hard disk, and then your probability of error goes down significantly because you have two copies, you can achieve the same probability of error or the other way around, the same number of nines in terms of reliability, not by having 2x of number of disks, by having only 1.35, right? So that difference, if you imagine a company like Microsoft, we literally spend billions on data centers, uh, that is a very big difference, right? So what makes Microsoft Research, which we usually abbreviate to MSR? So I hope if you don't mind if I, if I say MSR because it's shorter than Microsoft Research. So we have about over 1,000 people between researchers and engineers. Most of them are researchers, about more than two-thirds, because it is about research. It is a research lab. <clears throat> so it's, but if you look at the size of Microsoft, Microsoft has more than 100,000 employees, especially now that Nokia joined us. So uh, it's less than 1% of Microsoft, but you know, it's the largest computer science research organization in the world. I'm pretty sure you do not know any university where the computer science department has 1,000 people. <laughs> so we're equivalent to several computer science uh, departments. In fact, every year we hire the equivalent of a computer science <laughs> department, which means we spend a lot of effort trying to hire the, the, the right people. We cover the breadth of computing, anything related to computing, including lots of people in sociology, psychology, because of course how you, uh, as you saw in Jonathan's talk earlier today, how people interact with technology is incredibly important. Uh, global locations, we already talked about that. And of course, the last sentence there is one that we always use when we're interviewing young researchers for positions at MSR. Come work with us because you have the opportunity to literally impact uh, billions of people or hundreds of millions. So, and people do get excited about that. Uh, we see that researchers, they love to publish the result and they also love the idea that their work has a potential to influence uh, a, a good percentage of the world. Okay. So what is the value of Microsoft Research to Microsoft? Why do we have it? Why do we get back? I already gave you one metric. Our products do benefit from it. But do we benefit enough? Is the investment justified? Uh, of course, we think the answer is yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here talking about it. So some of the things, for example, the agil agility to drive and respond to technology shifts, that's actually quite important. Not only technology evolves, but the derivative of the evolution keeps going up things change faster. An example that you've all seen, who would guess that uh, some new communication tool like WhatsApp would go from a few users to almost half a billion users in less than two years? It's almost inimaginable, but it does happen. So things happen very quickly. If you put in a new technology, it can catch on very, very quickly, right? So, and because in research we're not tied to the day-to-day -day of delivering high-quality engineering products, we can step out a little bit and look at the te technology field and anticipate the changes and try to help the company with those, right? Of course, expand problem-solving capabilities. Do you think that engineering groups, they come to MSR and say, oh, I have this database problem, things are not fast enough, the memory is not optimized, can you help me with that? It happens all the time. <laughs> And as, as much as we can, uh, we really like in MSR to say yes to those questions. It, we feel as an obligation 
to answer yes, yes, we can help, yes, we will work with you to improve your engineering as well, even to the point of I'll stop working on my paper and I will work with you to improve this technology. It's part of the culture of Microsoft. But once I'm, once I'm done, yeah, I'm going to go back to the paper because that's fun too. So uh, the balance of the two is actually quite good for the, for the company, right? Naturally, we generate a lot of intellectual property. About 20% of the patents filed uh, come from MSR. As you saw, naturally promote the use of Microsoft platforms. Uh, the outreach team at Microsoft Research, they are, they are driving this event. This event is an example where we, we can connect and show you the advantages of Microsoft platforms. We go a step further. I'm pretty sure many of you have used many technologies that we distribute for free to academia, like the Kinect SDK and tools you saw Touch Develop. You saw, and there are many tools in software engineering, for example, which is a strong area naturally for Microsoft Research because we are a, a technology founded on software. Uh, many of those tools are available to you in academia, and sometimes they become available as part of a product, as part of the Visual Studio, but you can have your hands on tools like PAX and Z3, Touch Develop, many, many tools before they are available commercially. And we really like that, the idea that if we can help you grow, then we also benefit from that because we're going to hire your students <laughs> to work in our company and the whole field goes together and everything goes faster, so we all benefit from that. Enable other fields of science. I saw that here in the event, many nice applications on how can you use cloud computing to, to environmental science and hydrology, all kinds of scientific research. And of course, at the end of the day, it is about the main goal of Microsoft research is long-term impact. Now, let me go with that as a background. Let me talk about the advanced technology labs. And those are new. They've only been around about seven years. We started each lab. The newest one, as I said, hasn't even started. It will start later this year. So it is a younger organization. And what is that we're doing? And why, why do we have those advanced technology labs? It's basically diversity of research models. I already talked to you about diversity of people, because we have people all over the world. That helps the development, richer development of technologies. The other one is diversity of research models. So we still want continuing the main trust. You remember the first mission statement of MSR is advancing the state of the art. But since we invest a fair amount in research, as I told you, you can do a calculation. Whoa, to run a thousand researchers and engineers will, will cost you this much money a year. You can probably guess. Uh, we don't tell what the number is, but you can probably guess within an order of magnitude, right? Uh, given all that investment, which is a very small part, I mean, Microsoft invests about $10 billion in research and development every year, which is a very large amount. It's a very small percentage of that that goes into MSR, and within that, a small percentage can be a little more on applied research. Because research, naturally, you all understand that, and I just said in the previous slide, is about long-term impact. But what about short and medium-term impact? All of you have a ton of ideas. Our researchers and engineers have a ton of ideas. Can some of those be leveraged more quickly? I was just mentioning that things move fast. So we have some great ideas for the long term. Can we do something in the short term? Maybe with an opportunity for quicker business impact. That would be good for the company. So part of the ATL is about that. Pick up some areas and invest for faster impact. That usually means you have to develop prototypes, for example, faster to be able to test them quickly and see if you can ship them more quickly. Which means that most likely, and we do that, you need more engineers than researchers because you have a few researchers to help with the ideas, but you really need an engineering team to, to build the prototypes and try to work with the product engineering teams to see if we can ship something faster. And that's what we do in the advanced te technology labs. Right? So I actually established the vision, the mission statement for the ATL, and it's different. If you look at the first sentence, it says, create tangible technology innovations with high impact on Microsoft's businesses. Right? Now I put the Microsoft name on the number one because it is about short-term impact. I put tangible technology innovations. 
If a researcher from one of my ATL labs come to me and say, Rico, I published this wonderful paper, I'll say, wow, this is great. This is icing on the cake. What did you do in terms of prototype development? So I will ask about the prototype development first, and second, about the papers. Papers are also nice, because ideally, with the super high-tech world we live on, uh, being founded on research is still a good thing. And of course, in our lab, we should connect those labs to the MSR labs and tap on the research already conduct, conducted on those labs, and then add the engineering to, to have shorter term impact. And also leverage the local connections. For example, and I'll touch on that later, if you look at the lab in Cairo, uh, it is in, in the Arab world. The Arab world is very large. If you look at all the core countries together, it's about 500 million people. It's a large untapped potential because it's a, it's a region that keeps growing. And one interesting thing there, it's in that region, two aspects that are important. One is that the young generation, just like here you see as well in Latin America, people are multilingual. They speak their language and they also speak English. And when they use tools such as Bing and they look for information, they want a multilingual interface because they want uh, information both local and global because they are eager to connect the two and make sense of the information in that way, which means our ability to process other languages. And processing Arabic language is difficult. Indexing content in, in Arabic languages is difficult. And the lab in Cairo is able to add the necessary technology so that the performance of technologies or services like Bing would be high in that uh, area. So the local connections for each one of our labs are very important. So we call, we, one put way to see uh, pictorially this idea about the ATLs is that we bridge the innovation valley. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but think about on the right, product development, and on the left, research. Sometimes there is a gap. And in fact, I'm pretty sure many of you know that some companies have tried to do research and didn't necessarily find the best way to connect the two. So you would have wonderful research results that don't necessarily uh, help the business, right? I don't need to tell you stories about that. You know stories about that, right? But so with the ATLs, we try to put a bridge between the two. And we can say there's many terms we use. One is incubation. We can prototype a new idea and try it out before we actually try it as a product. That's why we also refers to risk reduction. We, the ATL, take the risk of trying something, even shipping something in Bing. So for example, my team in Cairo, they can actually modify Bing. They have access to the, to the code, they have access to the system, they can modify Bing. The Bing that runs in that region, they can't modify Bing globally without lots of other processes, but they can modify it locally. And then we can run experiments and if we learn things that we think will scale to other areas, then we can port those to, uh, to being globally, right? And it's more of an entrepreneurship, which is really intrapreneurship. We're trying to come up with innovations inside the company and move fast. So the idea of moving fast, shorter term impact, is in the heart of the ATLs. And of course, to achieve that, collaboration is key. For example, in my conversations with my teams in the ATLs, I always tell them, well, if you do some interesting research because that's needed to finish your idea and finish a prototype, that's super. But if you duplicate the research that is already being done in the core research labs, you're missing an opportunity, right? So again, bringing high quality prototypes is the core of what we do in the ATL. And in many cases, we also work with external partners, especially industry partners. And many industries depend on high technology and they are willing to take the risk with us on advance. Um, and just to give you an idea, some of the areas we work on, the Munich Lab works on Internet of Things, Data Analytics, Systems Assurance, Cairo, as I mentioned, uh, Natural Language Processing. They also help a lot on multimedia information retrieval, which there's ton of work to be done. I'm pretty sure all of you, when you do image searches on the web, 
nobody delivers that with the best possible experience. There's still lots to be done in terms of improving the ability to find images and video on the web. And the Cairo team is pushing in this direction. ATL Israel works on interaction mining and computer vision. I'll show you some examples of the computer vision work. In Brazil, we'll, we plan to work on document understanding and new search media experiences. Maybe in the next of these events, I'll be able to tell you in more detail what that means, because by then, hopefully, we'll have some results in that area, right? So now I would like to show you some examples of the work we do in those labs. For example, in the <clears throat> ATL Europe, which is our lab in Munich, is the largest of our ATLs. We have about 30, a little over 30 people there. And the main area of work is Internet of Things. Well, that term is a little broad. It can mean many things. And what they're mostly working on is developing a system such as the diagram in there. And the core vision is the following. Imagine that you're a data specialist and you're working on the cloud and you want to gather data from a bunch of sensors and you want to issue queries on that data, you want to learn things from that data, but you only want to work on the cloud and the data is provided by sensors. To be a bit more specific, for example, the work which we're working with Nissan, imagine that your car company is actually monitoring with dozens of sensors in every car all the time. So the car company sees what's happening to every car all the time and I can monitor that. Well, does that mean that each car with 12 or 20 sensors that are sending data, is the data being sent up to the cloud all the time? No, because it's too much data. <laughs> Sending all that raw data would be too much. Ideally, you only want to send the data that matters to the queries you want to run, to the analytics we want to run. So we implemented a system based on the SQL Azure streaming site technology to get a streaming data. So you issue the queries in the cloud and we push down queries to clients through the aggregation correlation and to the little servers in each of the data sources so that the queries actually can run all the way down to the sensor. For example, imagine I have a sensor measuring temperature every second, but the query only needs temperatures every minute. I can do the averaging at the sensor level before I upload the data. So simple things like that and more complex uh, calculations like that are distributed. So we automatically distribute the computation from the cloud to the server so that you can actually handle. For example, recently, a few months ago, we are using ourselves the technology in Office 365. All the servers of Office 365, in particular Exchange 365, it's the one that is implemented now, all servers of Exchange use that technology, which means when you're in a web browser running Outlook as an Office 365 client, if there's some performance degradation, we will know about that very quickly because we measure not what you're doing. We don't look at emails or anything like that, but the performance. Are windows loading faster? Are messages flowing fast enough? All these metrics are being measured all the time. So we can work together with IT managers on organizations and much more quickly fix problems. So this idea that Internet of Things is growing, I think is where most of the traffic of the Internet. In fact, today, do you know what most of the traffic of the Internet is? More than 50% is one file format of all the Internet. Of all the Internet, more than 50% is one particular file, file form. Yes, H.264. So uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. I think Internet of Things in less than 10 years is going to pass that because everything is being monitored by the Internet and you will want to monitor all kinds of things that you don't even think about today. But you need smart systems like that. Uh, and if you want to know more about this, we have some tools that are available. Just let me know. Um, this is just a, a diagram that shows the typical data flow, but many of you are experts in, in, in data management, so I don't need to talk much more about that. Um, let me talk a little about Connect and a little bit about this path between research and applied technology. And Connect is a good example in the two versions how we needed all of it to be able to deliver what we have today. This is actually something I built, and as you can see the date, in 1998, with erector sets, with a bunch of microphones, 
and people are like, what are you doing? Oh, I just want to play with lots of microphones at once, right? Uh, I, I was just talking uh, yesterday, I think was, I don't remember with whom, I think it was with Vidya, where saying, remember how the restaurant yesterday was very noisy? But in the middle of all that noise, you can listen to somebody and focus and, and listen to that. It's difficult, particularly yesterday evening, but you can. But you can do a quick experiment, cover one ear and try to do the same. You will not be able to do that because the fact that you have two ears and the phase differences in the two ears, it's fundamental for you to be able to zoom into a particular thing. Well, we're not, so, we're not as good as Mother Nature, so we need four. <laughs> We need four microphones. So many years later, we had our first prototype of a four element mic array. And if you look at the first Kinect from 2010, and you break it apart, and you see, in fact, the reason for the Kinect to be about a foot in length, because that's the distance we need for the microphones. If it were not for the microphones, it could be smaller, right? And since we have the space, we actually put some more stuff in there. But the main reason is for the microphone array. And just to give you an idea, what do we do with that? Because the problem with Kinect, it was really revolutionary because you don't have a controller anymore. But if you're playing the game and the phone rings, how do you stop the game? Because there's no button to press. You say, Xbox is stop, right? It's an easy thing to do. It's actually very powerful. Uh, I always say that because you don't have a controller, because you do not have a button to press, you cannot press the wrong button, right? And that opened up all kinds of new usages uh, of technology because you don't need to press a button. But see, for example, this sound. In the middle of the game, there's all these sounds, but then I'm trying to talk to, hey, Xbox, do this, do that. But how can Xbox listen to that? Even for you, it was a bit difficult to understand what's saying because there's all the sounds being played. You say, well, I, have, I need to remove those sounds and just leave your voice there. Some of you may ask, well, but you're playing the sounds. So if you're going to remove the sounds that you put in in the first place, it should be easy because you generated the sounds. You just subtract them back, right? This is a minor detail, because you're playing the sounds through a loudspeaker, they go through the acoustics of the room, and they, they come back to the microphone. And I know there's tons of smart folks in here who say, oh, there's a simple differential equation. It's a linear process that maps what you play out for what gets back in. Sure, there is a differential equation. A minor detail, the order of that is 4,000. Are you good about solving differential equations of order 4,000 and doing that 50 times a second because it changes as you move around? So, and that's what we have to do, and you do, and you get this. Xbox, sign out. Xbox, switch profile. So as you can see, it's not that perfect, but all that noise went away, and it's mostly the voice. And you could say, you could hear he's saying Xbox switch profile, right? So I'm going to skip this a little bit. Um, and as you can see, when we went to the new Xbox, which we just released uh, a few months ago, about half a year ago, you can see there's the new block with the new technology for the cameras, and there's the bar on the bottom, still with the four microphones, still in the same configuration. We didn't change the microphone technology. But we did change significantly how depth camera goes. The old Xbox would produce an IR pattern and read back with an IR camera, and the distortions of the pattern would tell you the depth, because we need to measure depth. With the new Xbox, we actually do a time of flight sensor. Basically, from the sensor, sorry for the drawing, we send a laser, and there is an object. We send a laser to the object. The object reflects the laser. We read it back. The time it takes for the laser to fly to the object and back, that's why we call time of fly, is a measure of distance, right? Well, if you do the calculations, if I want a resolution of about a centimeter or a centimeter and a half, I need to measure picoseconds. So, wow, that's a bit tricky. Not only that, so it's a tons of pixels per frame, but the problem is that multiple light paths generate what we call multipath, because if I send a laser to you, Another laser, when I'm scanning, may hit the table and hit you and get back to me. How do I differentiate the reflection that was a direct reflection from a, a direct path versus a reflected path? It takes a lot of computer vision to solve that. So the lab in Israel, we did two things. 
we actually found a new algorithm that reduced the dimensionality of the problem. And we put the engineering, because we had to work on 5% of the CPU, because the Xbox guys told you, you can only use 5% of the CPU, because the rest has to be for the game. Right? You can't use that much. And, and we did it. And if we not had done that, uh, we would not be able to ship <laughs> that technology. So it was really important to work very hard on the engineering in combination with the algorithms. I can't tell you about the algorithms yet because they will be published soon. And then at that point, I'll be able to tell you more. But we did a very nice combination of scientific push and the engineering push, and we came up. Uh, and I will show you why do you want to take all that trouble so basically, from basic research, research directed to the product, and then we get the impact of being able to ship the new Kinect. What can you do with the new Kinect? I think a good example is by this video that I would like to show to you. I'll point out the anatomical correctness. His hips are in the correct location. He has a multiple spine joints. So this joints. shows the skeleton model that bones, comes from the new Kinect. Multiple Connect. joints in his head and neck. So he can bend over, he can bend forward, he can move his head, shrug his shoulders. So, you know, we're connected. The first version was really about understanding gross human motion. We have true human you can see understanding on his hands here and fidelity that we can actually distinguish the motion Another of the hands. Another key advancement I'd like to point out is the new joints we've added in the hands. We have joints that represent tip of hand and the thumb. So as Scott is opening and closing his hands, you can see it being represented on screen. The skeleton is a great representation of the various bones and how they're connected together. But we took it a step further and started with orientation. Now this is Blockman, as a team calls him, and what Blockman represents is the actual orientation of Scott's body as he's moving in 3D space. As he rotates his hands and his arms and his legs, you can see that Blockman is you know, very accurately depicting what he's doing. So we're kind of getting beyond the joints, we have the actual rotations that his joints are experiencing. He can even draw small nose circles in the air, and we can see his head rotating on Blockman in line with what it is that Scott's doing. Now, and I'm a pretty tall guy, I'm six foot four, and my skeleton only weighs eight pounds. If you really want to understand what's going on with a human, you need to understand and describe what's going on with the muscles, the forces, the torques. So that's our intro into Muscle Man. <laughs> so Muscle Man is a real-time human-based physics model applied on top of our next generation skeleton and our high-resolution depth map. Uh, the, what the colors represent is green equals no force, and then the highest intensity red is the largest level of force. So as you see, as Scott kind of shifts his weight between one leg and the next, as he lifts a foot, you can see the red disc representing the greater force you know, on the floor being exerted. You can see changes in his core and in his legs. If I can get Scott to do a little bit of a squat for me. All right, go ahead and hold it. Like he's feeling it in his legs, and you can see it on the screen. Um, you know, normally I make him do that for a long time, but I'll go easy on him today. Um, so as you can see, um, the, the level of resolution for the skeleton models, and now these models, such as Muscle Man, are, are, are significantly better. And you could say, well, what, can I get my hands on that? Can I get a development toolkit for the new Kinect so I can actually use this technology? Yes. In a few months, it's coming up. So I, I already have my hands on one, and it's coming up. I don't, I'm not authorized to give you a date, but it's coming pretty soon, right? So, and probably the Connections team will have more information about that, as we, and, and I know you're well connected to them as we move forward, okay? So just to close, I want to show you something interesting that we do in ATL Cairo, which is social media analytics. Um, how can you do sentiment detection in messages, especially in social computing. How do you put together social computing and information from social networks together with search to maybe have a new experience in search? So we've been doing a lot of work in ATL Cairo on getting data, text sources from email, Twitter, Foursquare, Facebook, Instagram, all of those, and re break that apart, select the sentiment of those tweets which is very difficult. I mean, tweets, for example, are very short messages. Understanding if that's a positive tweet or a negative tweet may not be uh, easy. But then discover relations, find the topics, and use that information in conjunction with the information we crawl from the web for some experience. So for example, a few months ago, we, we launched, we launched uh, what we call a pilot or a flight, some portion of the traffic of Bing in Brazil. 
uh, we're trying uh, this technology. So, for example, if you, if you are in Brazil running Bing and you issue uh, in some topics, we only enable it for a few topics. For example, if you issue a search on a telenovela, as you know, just like here in Brazil, telenovelas are a big deal, right? Uh, and people want to know what the conversation is about the telenovela, so we kick in this system and we will bring up uh, some of the, what we think are most relevant tweets about what's going on in the novella. So it's an experiment of a different experience. So do you want to see the search results and at the same time what people are talking about that? Probably yes, right? And you can see that sentiment analysis is very difficult. For example, labeling of data, different words that mean different things in English and Portuguese because people may be typing in, in two languages. Uh, for example, it's less formal. For example, I love Messi for his goal. <laughs> Where's this word? Where's the word in dictionary? For some of you in Brazil, there is a new word that we invented in Facebook in Brazil, which is an arbitrary number of Ks. You can put a bunch of Ks together, and it just means you're laughing. Ka, 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 ka. <laughs> And you can put as many as you want. And all of those are variations of the same word. It just means you're laughing. So instead of LOL, you type a bunch of Ks. So that's why we need to understand the local way people interact with those. And then, oh, OK, they're laughing. So this is classified in a different way. So uh, data sampling, because you have lots and lots of tweets, each one giving you only a tidbit of information. So even the problem with what is an important tweet, what is a not an important tweet, there's tons of noise and the tidbits of cool information. Finding those tidbits is difficult. Uh, we can have multiple targets because a sentence may be talking about several things at the same time and you don't know uh, uh, what the sentence is really trying to say. Negation, so I didn't like Angelina Jolie in this movie. You have gotta be careful, that's a negative thing. Uh, sarcasm, look at this one. What a great car, it stopped working in two days. Yay, of course you're being sarcastic, but you, detecting that is not that trivial. So that's why the natural language processing expertise we have in Cairo really has helped in there. So again, since I talked about Angelina Jolie, uh, something we're trying to experiment, and we haven't really released this yet, is the idea of bringing gossip and news if your search is about entertainment, right? Uh, and you can imagine business implications of doing that, not just different kinds of advertisements, but connections with the companies that supply that kind of information. So there's all kinds of possible business which we are still exploring. Well, I promise you I would recover back some time because you must be hungry. So I will stop here. And I hope I gave you a good idea about the ATLs. Thank you. <clears throat> Don't know if we have time for questions. All right. So thank you very much, Rico. All right. That's an amazing uh, introduction to all the things we do do in our labs. <clears throat> Questions? Thank you. Um, I was wondering what is the relationship that you want to create between uh, students in universities and these new labs? Is it similar to what you have in MSR or is it different? That's a good question. You're asking about the relationships with the students. Uh, we try to have roughly the same. For example, in the Cairo lab, the problem with diversity is a little more difficult than in other areas of the world. We see fewer girls uh, wanting to study computer science, so we put a little more effort in programs such as DG Girls and others to attract those students to, to get the girls more excited about technology. And we try to have the same kinds of internships uh, for college internships, PhD student internships, but when we bring them in, we explain, look, this lab is more about applied research. So if you're interested in, in more fundamental research, in more core research, you may want to consider one of the other labs, but if you really want to get your hands dirty and do something more applied and work maybe in some of the code as well, many of the researchers actually, like me, they like to write code, and, and we actually have now an environment that might be better suited to those. But other than that, it's roughly the same. Yeah. Yes. 
you must be hungry. <laughs> Another one there. Thank you. Well, I, I don't know if it's too specific, but it's about the, um, the application, the research you uh, at the end on sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues in sentiment analysis is that most of the methods are based on dictionaries. That uh, you take one language, let's say Brazilian, you know that certain words have certain polarity, that like they are more positive, more negative. And, and then you use that as a baseline to start mm -hmm. like classifying the reviews or any other content. So uh, in, in are, are you doing something in, 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 in that research or in any other in order to, to build this uh, sentiment analysis, but not based on dictionaries, maybe model-based, I don't know, so in order to, to deal with that problem? That's a very good question because you could say that the dictionaries that we usually ref refer to when analyzing language, when we're looking at tweets or Facebook comments and things like that, things don't apply that directly. So we can't rely too much on dictionaries. So because of that, you're totally right, and we do two things. One is adapt to learn new dictionaries. For example, in Brazil, we have to learn kakakakaka, which is a word with an arbitrary number of keys, right? In the Arab languages, it's even more complicated than, than that. They have a few different kinds of dialects that got created within the social networks, and you need to adjust to that. And the second one, you use more machine learning tools, so you actually try to get as many signals as you can for when something is positive or negative and rely a little less on the dictionaries and rely more on the data correlations you can get from the machine learning tools. So, in fact, that's one of the reasons why the Cairo Lab is a great place to do that because the effect of this language uh, modification within the internet and within those tools is really strong in the Arab region. So we're learning a bunch of things that maybe we can apply to other regions as well. Thank right. you. Thanks. Great. Well, I think we'll uh, stop there and thank Rico once right. again for his... Talk. Thank you, folks. And so now uh, we're going to hand over to our chairs who are going to give us their closing remarks. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Rico, again. Thank you, Rico. We're going to keep it short. We do know that... Uh, Lunch is coming and people have to take some flights. Uh, I just wanted to start by saying that it has been a great honor to be an integral part of uh, this ninth Latin American Faculty Summit in this beautiful country, Chile. And uh, we just spent three days uh, all together thinking about how to advance science and technology through computing research. Uh, now I would like to thank, uh, as the program chair for this event, uh, I would like to start thanking our, all our keynotes and uh, session speakers, as well as our demoers who've been, who've been doing a fantastic uh, job. And of course, you, the audience, like all of you, right? Without whom we wouldn't have this event. And uh, I would also like to thank, personally, our demo chair, uh, Mike Zaskowski, uh, who's been doing a fantastic job with the demoers and also in trying to align the demos with uh, the rest of the program. And last but not least, I really, really enjoyed, this is the first time I work on the Latin American Summit, so I really want to thank Jaime, my partner, during this event. Thank you, thank you. Everyone. And that's very much reciprocal, being such a fantastic experience to work with, with Evelyn uh, here in Latin America. Thank you, really. Now, I would also like to think that the, the event doesn't conclude today. I know every one of us has to return home, <clears throat> but what I mean is that I would like to, the event to continue through sev uh, several meetings, projects, collaborations that potentially will generate through all of the networking that you have done here. And also, based on all of the pre great presentations, very inspiring presentations that you have attended at this event. All of which can make us really very proud to all of us to say what a successful and rewarding event. 
So please continue with the event through all of these meetings that you and collaborations that you will be having. And hopefully we also would like to have collaborations with you as well. Something very important is that uh, you will be receiving a survey, first an email, which will contain a URL for the uh, survey. That's really will be very much appreciated if you can just fill it out. Very simple. It will not take you more than a uh, few minutes to, to do it, but that's very, very important. <coughs> Now, uh, I think Evelyn and I also would like to thank very, very much to Tony Hay, who really is our main sponsor, because uh, without uh, being able to, to uh, hold this event here. So I would like, please, to join me with a round of applause for Tony. And I would like Tony, please, to join us here as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Jaime and uh, Evelyn. So I, I do want to say just a, a few words of thanks to a, a number of people who made this event possible. First of all, to the Minister and the Ministry, Ministerio de Economia, uh, who came and, and, and sponsored the event, and uh, that was really uh, made this event possible. Uh, the, the other key partner was Microsoft Chile, and I would like to just mention uh, the GM, uh, Oliver Flogel, um, the innovation director, Wilson Pice, and Sergio Larraine, who is marketing and operations director. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to thank very much the, the marketing and operations team, Macarena and Josefina, and to Macarena for helping me start the dancing last night. So. <laughs> Can we give them all a round of applause? There's a few other thanks I would like to do. One is the, the, uh, the event and the local agency. That's Miguel, Maori, and the team. So give them a round of applause. They've done a great job. Thank you very much. My team has been really working very hard, as you have seen. Um, Mike and the Demo Fest did a great job. Uh, has he got up yet? Has he got a hangover, really? Yeah. Was he, he was seen coming in about 3 o'clock this morning. Uh, I'm not sure how he's doing. Um, uh, the MSR event support team, uh, you have Melissa and Sarah outside, and lots of other people in the IT team and the audio-visual team, they really worked hard to make this event possible. So can we give them a round of applause too? <laughs> and I'm almost done. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers, and especially the keynote speakers. I thought they all gave a great job. Uh, instead of being able to wander around the town, I unfortunately found it interesting to attend all the lectures. So I, I didn't get any time to see uh, Vigna Del Mar. Uh, because it was too interesting. But uh, they did a great job. Uh, I thought the audience, you were really make this possible, and it really, I thought the attendance, the punctuality was a little uh, uh, lax on occasion, uh, <laughs> but I guess that's uh, manana, right? Uh, but uh, <laughs> but it was a, it was a, you were a great audience, and I'm very grateful. But, but uh, my last thanks really must go to Evelyn and to Jaime, they really did a great job in putting together a great program, coordinating all the events, making lots of visits, making sure everything worked well. So as a final round of applause, can I ask you to, to thank yourselves and Jaime and Evelyn. So thank you.